situated here, but thank you. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So, all right. That's, uh, All right, enough of all that. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. We're continuing our sermon series on all the miracles of Jesus that we have recorded. And here we're looking at a, uh, a lame excuse with a weak and poor response. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, great message, uh, talking about excuses and uh, responding in pathetic ways. But uh, this is actually one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's, uh, I hope uh, by the time we're done, you'll say, oh, that makes sense, because why would I say one of my favorite passages is about a lame excuse and a poor response? Well, well you'll see. So John chapter 5, uh, we're kind of picking up where um, John's different because he kind of jumps around a lot more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so you get phrases like, after a while or sometime later, and it expresses an event that occurs. But we do know that uh, when it comes to making excuses, we all are guilty of that. Uh, we like to consider ourselves uh, more than what we are. Uh, we, like to, we like to give great um, attention to our intentions. Oh, I meant well. We love to say that kind of stuff, and we like to excuse when, we, when it turns out not the way that we really wanted it to. It's not really our fault. Um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't mean for it to go this way. And sometimes we're just oblivious to what Jesus calls us to, and sometimes we really don't care about um, what he is asking us. And so I hope that uh, you'll see uh, why this is a great passage, why I consider it one of my favorites, and maybe it'll become one of yours as well. Here at Pinewood, there's just one place in the universe where you can go to find absolute truth. It's the Bible, which is the very word of God. Every single word of it is directly inspired by him. It is inerrant, meaning it has no errors. So what God says is true, it is true. It's infallible, that it will never fail. It will never be proven wrong. You and I can trust it completely. And today we can trust it when we are, are called to really just stop making excuses and really just uh, determine what Jesus calls us to know, to be, and to do, and to, to obey. That's what he's really calling us to do, is to obey. Hear now the word of the Lord, John chapter 5. We're going to look at 15 verses. After this, it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for your word and for this somewhat bizarre narrative concerning this man who was healed and didn't even know who Jesus was and also wasn't really concerned to find out. And Father, we recognize that in so many ways, we don't really care, that we just are excited about what we consider good luck or how things kind of all worked out, not realizing that you intervene, you bring healing, you bring wholeness, you bring reconciliation, you make things right, not, not for our pleasure, not necessarily for our comfort, but rather for your plan and for your purpose. And so, Father, we pray that we would live our lives seeking your purpose, 
seeking to follow your plan. And today I pray, Father, that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, would be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and redeemer. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the passage just starts out saying, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now, I told you that as you look through the Gospels, we have four accounts, and it's great because we have four different perspectives on who Jesus is and what he has done. And so you have these different individuals inspired by the Holy Spirit who give us really a greater understanding, a, a more clear and full picture of all that Jesus came to do, what he wants us to know, what he wants us to understand concerning who he is and, and, uh, and what we are to, to believe and, and how we are to interact with with him. And so we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are known as the synoptics. They are very similar in how they are laid out. Chronologically, they kind of follow the same timeline. So it's very easy to see as they are going from one point to the other what they're trying to communicate. Mostly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, particularly Matthew, are written for Jewish people. It's for a Jewish audience. And John, not so much. Yes, Jewish people are reading it, but it really is for Gentiles. It's really for other people to hear about Jesus. So John doesn't get into all the details. He just uses basically broad brush strokes to say, hey, there's this feast. Now he'll mention when it's Passover, but otherwise he's like, I don't want you to get caught up and start asking questions about which feast. Now, commentators all agree that more than likely the feast that is occurring when Jesus heals this man as the Feast of Booths, you know, Sukkoth is the Hebrew term, or the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a reminder of, of God delivering the Jewish people from Egypt and how they basically had no permanent home. They lived in tents. The idea is that God is our dwelling place. If you read through the Psalms, you hear that, that and we should recognize that. You might have a great home, and that's fantastic, but once a year, God called his people to live in a temporary setting to remind them, this isn't really your home, and Egypt wasn't your home, and I'm bringing you to, ultimately, the promised land. In fact, Leviticus 23 says, you shall dwell in booths for seven days that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It's, it's kind of funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's never... There are never any coincidences. So I'm talking about the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkoth, which actually starts today. So the Jewish people, or those who are faithful to following um, through the Old Testament principles, are going to live in temporary shelters for the week. As a reminder, this world isn't your home. Maybe, maybe we need that. Maybe we need something to remind us that this world is not our home. It's temporary. We get so caught up with everything that's going on. We get so focused on the here and now that we lose sight of the fact that everything that we see, everything that we own, will soon pass. Only what's done for Christ shall last. That's the famous poem, and it's true. So there's this feast. John says, don't worry about it. I'm sharing with you because I want you to know, because you come to Pinewood, and we expect our people here at Pinewood to know God's word and to understand it and to see how it truly applies to us. So we'll talk to you about the fact that that feast, more than likely, is the Feast of Booths. Here's the reason why I love this passage. It really helped me in a lot of ways in my ministry now that I've been doing this since 1995 and have been doing it in the PCA this summer for 20 years. Actually, it was August that I was ordained uh, 20 years ago in the PCA, and of course, uh, July of this year, 10 years of Pinewood. So I'm just thankful that I've been able to uh, serve God, have the opportunity to be able to serve all of you, and uh, for all of you to be so gracious and, and generous to me. I, I really don't uh, deserve it, and I'm still uh, just feeling super lucky in that great theological term, super lucky <laughs> to be your pastor. But as a pastor, I do struggle, um, and, I, and I think for a lot of young pastors, and I know we've got a lot of individuals that are preparing for full-time ministry, but one of the things I always struggled with, and it was really this passage that God used to help me, was that I, just, I always felt there was, I could do more. You know, There's, you're never really off. I tell people um, I have a flexible schedule as a pastor. I just don't have a set schedule. 
I mean, and there's always things that happen. Uh, I can make plans and uh, ultimately something terrible happens to someone else. I need to be there. I need to change what I'm going to do. There's plenty of sporting activities of my kids I've missed because I had to go to the hospital or I had to interact and see someone, had to deal with a crisis that where people were going through. I had to leave plenty of, of uh, dinners and things of that sort. It's flexible, though. I have that flexibility. That's nice. I tell the staff, when you have the ability to do something, do it. Because you might plan it and find out God has something else planned that's going to take you away that evening or away from that weekend or that event that you've planned. But I always had a, some sense of guilt. Now, this is funny because, I, if anything, I hope I'm known for, for preaching the gospel of grace. That uh, God is gracious, that he is forgiving, that he is compassionate, that, that what we have isn't because of anything that we have done, but rather what Christ has done on our behalf. That, that we are looking fully to Jesus and not to ourselves. So I'm always presenting and promoting that it's all about Jesus and, and what he thinks of us and what he has done for us. It's not about what we do, but as a pastor, I always feel there's always one more person I could call. There's always one more email I could write. There's always one more touch or contact I could make. There's always more studying I could do for my sermons. There's, there's always something more, and it just seems that there's no way ever to say, okay, I'm done. It, it's, okay, it's, I'm done. It's, it's time to shut down. It's time to fulfill my other roles in life, I, to be that, that husband and that father and that, and that uh, son and that, that brother. And it always seems that ministry consumes a lot of guys, and that's why the average tenure of a pastor at a church is 18 months. We just kind of burn out pretty quickly. And it's this passage that speaks to me. And you're probably wondering, what are you talking about? Actually, what speaks to me, and I just want to share because we've been together for so long, 10 years. I just want to share with you my heart. That what I want to share with you is something I think you need to hear too. And I haven't had the opportunity to share it like I can today. What I'm going to share with you isn't even written. It's inferred. It's not something specifically stated. It's something that you have to see as you read this account. And this is what it is. That here we are at this pool called Bethesda. And in it lay a multitude of invalids, a multitude. Normally in the Greek, they'll say one or two or several but when they just don't want to count because it's way too many, they just say a multitude. If it's really, really big, they'll say 10,000 times 10,000. We're just not counting. It's just too many to count. There's a multitude. This is a place in which there is a lot of misery, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. There is a multitude of individuals that are blind, that are lame, um, that are paralyzed. A multitude. Now, it's interesting that, and this is another thing, it's just an aside, but the fact is, is that for so many years, this passage was used by critics of God's word to say, the Bible's not true, because there was no proof that there were these pools in Bethesda. And it wasn't until 1964 that in an archaeological dig, about 100 feet north of St. Anne's Church in Jerusalem, they discovered these pools. And not only that, but in the writing, it spoke of their healing power. And sure enough, there are five roofs. It's a big square, with, so it has four walls around it, and then it's divided in the middle. So there's actually five roofs. And people would be there waiting for the water to be stirred up. So there is now archaeological proof that this place existed and that it was used in the way that we see it being used in this passage. But there's a multitude. That speaks to me. Let me tell you why. We have Jesus probably stepping over people, working his way around them to get to this man. Jesus has the power to heal every single person there. I mean, he doesn't even have to do anything as dramatic as this. Snap his finger. He could just make it so. And yet he doesn't. He can do all things. And yet he doesn't. He walks past a multitude of individuals who he could help. 
who he could heal, who he could instantly cure, and he doesn't because he has a plan. And his reason for coming wasn't to heal every person who had an ailment. Yes, we've got a whole list of miracles, 37 of them that we're spending time looking at. But his purpose for coming wasn't to heal everyone. His purpose for coming was to fulfill the prophecies that God made of one who would come, the Son of God, his very Son, in the flesh, who would ultimately take away the sins of those who would receive and rest upon him alone. Jesus had a plan. And there are nights when I've been restless in my sleep. Where I could sometimes lose it. In fact, there is an individual here today who sent me an email last week that went into my junk mail. And I just found it this morning. And that person wanted my help. I needed my counsel. And that saddens me, and I'm going to follow up. I'll see you this afternoon. But that stuff used to kill me. I wasn't there. But now I recognize more and more. Pastor, why are you saying this? You, you proclaim God's sovereignty all the time. I do, but I need to hear it. And more than just proclaiming it, guys, I need to believe it too. That there's nothing that happens by accident. And that God's planning and his timing is right. And I can't do everything. Jesus could, and he didn't because he was working God's plan. I know I can't do it all. But I can do all that God has planned for me. And friends, that has soothed my heart and soul and my mind, and I want to share that with you. You can't do it all. You can do what God has planned for you. So every day, begin your day asking, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Help me to do what you have planned for me. Not what everyone else says I should be doing. Not what I think I should be doing. What do you have planned for me? Because Jesus was able to do so much more than I can do, but yet what he did was exactly what he was called to do by his heavenly father. I came not to do my own will, he says. I came to do the will of my father. Friends, I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of my father. And I find great comfort in that. Jesus stepped over a multitude of people he could have helped to do what God called him to specifically do. And for many of us, we're killing ourselves, trying to do it all. The expectations that everyone has on us, whether from work or what they have expectations in terms of how we're supposed to be as husbands or as wives or as parents. I mean, bearing, being a parent is hard today. If you don't have your kids in all of these activities or doing all these things, you're a terrible parent. And so we're running all over the place nonstop trying to make sure that our kids don't miss out on anything. I don't know what's happened, but I went to school and I was a good student. I didn't have anywhere near the homework that kids have nowadays. I played sports and there were not the amount of practices. I mean, football now goes on year round. We did football, then we did wrestling, then we did something else in the spring, track. Now it's just nonstop all the time. We're busy, busy, busy. You used to be able to kind of shut down from work. We thought technology would make things better. It hasn't. Now we're available all the time. You can take work with you. And then people say, oh, I get to work from home. That's not good. Those of you who work from home. Because you can't leave your office. Like, where are you going to go? I'm done with work. I'm going to go outside in the garage. Maybe that's what it is. I can't do it all. And in the 10 years that I've been here, I know I haven't done it all. And I've let a lot of you down. And I have fallen short in a lot of ways with a lot of you. And I'm thankful for your grace that you've shown to me. But I also let you know that maybe you feel like you've let people down. And you've tried to do it all. Stop. Do what God has planned for you. Well, how do you figure that out? It's here in his word. And you can spend time with him in prayer. You know you have the Holy Spirit living within you who brings to mind all that you need to know. And if you live a life 
focusing on him and saying, Lord, I can't do it all. I want to do what you have planned for me. I want to do your will. There'll be a great burden taken from you. And you can find joy again in life and not always worrying that you didn't do everything perfectly, didn't follow through and make everything right. So, that's why I love this passage. Jesus, Jesus walked over, passed by individuals he could have healed, but that wasn't his plan. That wasn't the reason why he was at Bethsaida. He was there to interact with this man. Here's something else. Can someone read aloud for me verse 4? If you have a new version, a new translation, just skip it. It goes from 3 to 5. Where'd it go? All right. So here's an aside. I just want you to understand a little bit about Bible translations. If you, got, if you have the King James, if you have that, then you're good. You've got, you've got verse 4. Right? I'll read it. It says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Well, what most Bible scholars have determined was that wasn't actually in the original writings of John's gospel. That came later. Now here, this might blow your mind. The King James Version, first published in 1611, all right, first published in 1611, is one of our oldest English translations. We talked about William Tyndall a little bit ago about how he gave us kind of our first English translation. But there's a new translation that was made in 1611 that was authorized by King James. What they used as the basis of their translation are manuscripts that they had at the time. Those manuscripts were actually not that old, relatively speaking. They're from the the 4th century, the 8th century, copies of copies of copies. Well, now in modern times, with all the archaeology that we have done and, and the manuscripts that we have found, we actually have manuscripts, we have copies of God's Word that are, that are much, much older, first century. So for the newer translations, they use older manuscripts. The older translation, the King James, actually used newer manuscripts. So with our newer translations, we're able to say, we don't see these in the older manuscripts. They'll make a footnote. And most Bibles have it saying they add this amount. The reason why most scholars say it wasn't originally in there is because when John originally wrote it, everyone knew about the pool. They knew what it could do. They knew how it operated. They didn't need to, to, uh, to have anyone explain it. But, you know, centuries later, when it was destroyed, when Jerusalem was destroyed, people wanted to know, well, what about Bethesda. What, what about it? I mean, how did this happen? Well, let's make a note. By the way, an angel of the Lord came down, stirred up the water. Whoever went in there first was healed. John originally didn't have to give all that. Everyone knew if you're the first one in the water, you're going to be healed. And we found out in 1964 that that's exactly what they said about that pool. Pretty amazing. So verse 4, not going to have it. There are times in which you'll find passages like that. It doesn't undermine the inerrancy of God's word. Most will say we have this in, in more recent manuscripts, but in the older manuscripts, it's not. The whole ending of Mark, most earlier manuscripts don't have that, but it's in there. So you have to be careful when you find someone who is a King James-only person talking about, you have to have the King James because these newer versions take out stuff from God's Word. Well, now you understand it's not taken out. It's saying that it was probably added, and it wasn't what was originally given. So just to make you smarter. That's all. Just so you can talk with people. And then you can joke with them, have them read, say, hey, could you read for me John chapter 5, verse 4? Or you can tell people you, you've got it memorized. Okay. We're expository here. We preach the passage as it's given. So Jesus. Jesus knows there's this man who's been here for 38 years in this condition. And it says, verse 6, that when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? <laughs> it's like someone who's drowning, you know. Hey, do you want to be saved? No, I got this. I'm good. 
I never thought of Jesus as being Captain Obvious. <laughs> Do you want to be healed? A pretty simple question, huh? Right? Do you want to be healed? And the guy says, absolutely, yes, I want to be healed. No. He starts making excuses. What do you ask me if I want to be healed? I'm trying. I got no one to carry me down there. And if I try it on my own, someone beats me to it. What are you asking me? Do I want to be healed? I've been here for 38 years. I'm in this position. He's really making an excuse. He doesn't want to hear from Jesus. He doesn't even ask, like, can you heal me? What, what do you mean? He's kind of lost all hope at this point. He's kind of feeling, hey, this is how it's always been. I don't expect anything different. I've been doing this for 38 years. Do I want to be healed? I don't know. I don't have anyone to help me there. And even when I try, someone beats me to it. And you might think, what is going on here? I mean, Jesus is asking him, do you want to be healed? And he makes excuses. He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. He just says, this is kind of how it is. And for you and me, don't be too hard on this guy because we make lame excuses as well. Do you know the solution to all of your problems are in God's word? Do you know the key to abundant living, pleasing God, and a life that glorifies God is all found readily available right here in God's Word? If you have issues in your marriage, there are clear and plain solutions in God's Word. If you're having difficulty with your children, there are clear and concise explanations and ways in which you can resolve that. Are you having problems with your parents? Ditto. What to do and how to manage your finances, clear instruction. How to interact with fellow believers, it's in there. How to deal with people you don't even like and don't like you, same thing. How you deal with employers or your employees, it's like ragu, it's in there. I know, but you don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. Oh, that's not my kids. Uh, that might work for you, but I don't know. They're really difficult. Oh, my parents, they just don't understand. Oh, yeah, Will, Will Smith reference. That's beside the point. I don't know, know if you're tracking me on that. When we see issues in our life and we know what we're called to know, to be, and to do... We don't do it. We don't believe it. And we make excuses about it. Be honest. Do you want your marriage to be restored and reconciled? You can say, oh, yeah. But more than likely, we say, ah, it's been like this for 38 years. Do you want to overcome that addiction? I've tried a couple times now, it hasn't worked. You want to be faithful in your finances. Ah, this doesn't add up. The math doesn't work. How about that unresolved issue with a coworker, with a family member, with a friend? Well, I'll forgive when they forgive. I'll respond if they initiate. You want to be healed? There's just no one really to bring me down there. I can't move as fast as everyone else. It's eh, kind of how it is. You see, you, you make excuses. Jesus is very clear. He asks simple and direct questions. He even says, do you want to be saved? And for some, we, well, I don't save from what?
Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be reconciled? Do you want to give and offer forgiveness? Do you? Well, of course, the reason why Jesus healed this individual was because of declaring who he is, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's, that's what it says. It's, oh, by the way, this was the Sabbath. And there's several times in the gospel in which Jesus does something on the Sabbath. And people get bent out of shape particularly the Pharisees who created kind of their own laws. And they created their own laws because they felt they could obey those laws. And they added different things that weren't even in the commands of God. And that's what happens here. They're saying to this man after they see him, like, hey, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bed. Well, you can look through all of God's word. You will find no commandment that says don't carry your bed. The only thing that comes close is Jeremiah 17. That says, thus says the Lord, take care for the sake of your lives and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it in the gates by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your house on the Sabbath or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy as commanded, as I commanded your fathers. This had nothing to do with like carrying a bed. If you look in Jeremiah, he's talking about them bringing in stuff to sell, doing commerce trying to make a little extra cash. They're coming in to Jerusalem not to honor God and and to, you know, enjoy God and the Sabbath. They're coming in because they thought, hey, it's an extra day to make some money. And they took that and said, you can't carry anything. And they've got a whole list of laws concerning what can be carried and what, what cannot. And we talked about it before. You can pick up a rock, but you can't throw a rock. So why would you pick up a rock if you're not going to throw it? But that's beside... It's beside the point. I don't, I don't understand it. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. So they tell the guy, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath, verse 10. And it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. Don't blame me. This guy told me to do it. Blame him. Well, who's that guy? I don't know. Look at this guy. He is so pathetic. Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? He's like, "Uh, it's kind of hot. People won't carry me. Can't make it on my own. Heals him and doesn't say thank you. Thank you. Who are you? He like picks up his mat. He's like, well, he told him to go. Off he went. And they ask him, hey, who did this? And he's like, I don't know, some guy. Some guy. And that's how most people are. They, they like what Jesus can do, potential benefits, but they don't really want to know him. They don't want to interact with him. God, give us the good stuff, but I don't need you. Jesus... Bring the blessing, but don't bring yourself. And Jesus stepped over other people that are probably more deserving. Probably would have been more grateful. But that wasn't his plan. His plan was to come and heal this man. And ultimately, even to confront this man, Jesus says something that can be quite troubling. So he says, I don't know who healed me. He didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus had withdrawn. He could have gone after him. He was able to walk. We know that. He picked up his mat. Why didn't he go after Jesus? He didn't care. He got what he needed. And there are individuals even today that will cry out to Jesus. They'll come in and talk with me and they'll plead. And they'll say, if if God would only restore, if he would only heal, if he would only bring wholeness, if he would only allow me to prosper... And God in his grace does it. And I never see him again. Sometimes there's people who show up and I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on. Because that's the only time I ever see them. 
So this guy is like, well, I'm healed. And oh, you Jews, don't blame me. I'm not, I'm, I'm good. I'm only doing it because I was told to do it. So you take that up with the guy who healed me. Who's that? I don't know. Really don't care. In fact, we know that he never even decided to say, you know what, who is this guy? This guy healed me. I, I, I need to at least say thank you to him. Verse 14, it's Jesus who finds him. He doesn't, he's not even seeking Jesus later on. Jesus comes and finds him. And then he says something that troubles a lot of people because they misunderstand what he's saying. Jesus says, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. That sounds, sounds scary. Stop sinning so nothing worse happens to you. Now, is Jesus specifically giving a theological doctrine that if you sin, bad things will happen to you? Well, quite frankly, that is true. There is a sense in which we experience the consequences of our sin sometimes. The promise of the gospel is that in Christ there is now therefore no condemnation. That's important to understand. Let me explain it. If someone commits murder, they can repent, turn to Jesus, and they are fully forgiven, and they are no longer condemned. And they can be declared right and just in God's eyes. But the consequence might be spending the rest of their life in prison or even being put to death. So condemnation versus consequence. We've talked about it before, but we need to be reminded of it. But Jesus isn't specifically talking about that. He, he's saying something to get this man's attention, and the man doesn't even listen. He just wants to make sure he found out who it is so he can go back to the Jews and be in their good favor and say, oh, it's Jesus who healed me. Blame him. Don't blame me. Blame him. Now, we do know that there is a reality in which, you know, sometimes our sin, that physical action that we do, there is a spiritual consequence, and sometimes their spiritual consequences do exhibit themselves physically. In fact, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper uh, shortly. This passage says, and we're going to look at it later, the disciples said, hey, Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind, the man or the parents? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So there are times when there is no sin involved whatsoever, and individuals have that. But there are those times where disobedience results in physical calamity. Paul writes, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and blood, um, without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper where, the, where the, the warning is, make sure that you're not doing this in an unworthy manner, not discerning what it's all about. This isn't for you if you're not in Christ. This isn't for you if you're not one who's professed saving faith in him, that by doing that, Paul's saying some of you are handling it and mishandling it in such a way that you're weak, ill, and some have even died. Jesus finds him and says, see, you're well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. This man thought probably the worst thing that could ever happen to him is now over. I was paralyzed for 38 years. Now I can walk. And Jesus says, you're still not getting it. It'd be better for you. In fact, we addressed this back in Mark chapter 2. When Jesus healed the man who was lowered down through the roof. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Remember, I shared with you, it would have been better for him just to hear that and not walk than to be made to walk and not hear that his sins were forgiven. That's what Jesus is saying here. You can now walk. You have no desire to connect with me. See that you sin no more so that something worse doesn't happen. You think being paralyzed is bad? Wait till you stand before a holy God and you are found condemned because of your rebellion, your sin. When you stand before a perfect and pure, righteous judge who won't hear any of your excuses. And you know what that man should have done? Sin no more? You're asking the impossible of me. What do you mean? If I sin, something worse is going to happen. I, uh, what do I do? I mean, I can go a while without sinning, but sin no more? I can't. What are you telling me here? I, th this, is, this is awful. What, what, 
What solution is there? What help do I have? Who can save me from this condition? If it's because of my sin, something worse is going to happen. What do I do? Help me. Nothing. That's, he should have responded that way. What do I do? I'm, I'm hopeless in this situation then. I'm undone. You and I, you and I can't stop sinning. Try as you may, you'll still fall short. Now, we're called to pursue righteousness, no question about it, but you're still going to sin. And the hope of the gospel is that even though we do fall into sin, our righteousness doesn't come from us. It comes from Jesus himself. In fact, that's why our call to worship said, praise God for his righteousness. Do you thank God for his righteousness? You should, because the command is to sin no more. And you can't do that. But Jesus was without sin. And Jesus' record can be in place of yours. And his death upon the cross can pay the penalty for your sin. Jesus is giving this individual an opportunity to acknowledge him and to come to him and to receive from him something far greater than being able to walk. And that is to be made right and to be delivered and saved from the consequences, the condemnation of his sin. And the man doesn't respond. Not to Jesus. He doesn't say, can you help me, Jesus? You helped me once. Obviously, there's something unique about you. You made me walk. I was paralyzed for 38 years. And you gave me the ability to walk instantaneously. You're telling me to sin no more or something worse is going to happen. Help me. You've helped me walk. Can you, can you help me with my sin? But we don't have that. It's just the man went away, verse 15, and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews, as goes on, were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. They were more concerned about their rules than God's rules, than what God asked. What a weak response. We kind of go off and then we want to justify ourselves or make sure people understand why we were carrying our mat on the Sabbath. This man wanted to make sure that he followed up to let them know, it's not me, it was Jesus. He told me to do it. Take your issue with him. As opposed to seeing what Christ has done and saying, Lord, what would you have me do? So our takeaway, very simple as we come to the table, where do you need to stop making excuses and fully respond? Is it in your thought life? Is it in your browser history? Is it with drugs or alcohol? Is it with anger? Is it with your marriage? Is it with your kids or with your parents or with your coworkers or with your neighbors? Where have you been making excuses and kind of justifying why it is as it is? Where you kind of say, hey, I've tried. I don't have anyone to help me. Someone beats me to it didn't work. You don't understand my circumstances. You don't know the situation. Where are you making excuses? Where is the time to acknowledge your need for Jesus and fully respond to him and cling to him and him only? Maybe it has to do with salvation. Or maybe you are saved, but you're just living your life on your own, trying to make it work. Where do you need to stop making excuses? Where do you need to fully respond? You think about that. Amen.